Section 24 The French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Hilaire Belloc. Section 24, Chapter 5 Continued The Military Aspects of the Revolution. The consequence of this strange passage upon the political history of the time we have already seen. Its consequence upon the military history of it was indirect, but profound. The French forces, such as they were, were still intact, but no general officer could in future be trusted by Paris, and the stimulus which nations in the critical moments of invasion and of danger during foreign war seek in patriotism, in the offering of a high wage to men, and of honours and fortunes to their commanders, was now sought by the French in the singular, novel, and abnormal experiment of the terror. Command upon the frontier throughout 1793 and the first part of 1794, during the critical fourteen months, that is, which decided the fate of the revolution, and which turned the tide of arms in favour of the French, was a task accomplished under the motive power of capital punishment. A blunder was taken as proof of treason, and there lay over the ordering of every general movement the threat of the guillotine. What we have now to follow is somewhat over a year of struggle thus abnormally organized upon the French side, and finally successful through the genius of a great organizer, once a soldier, now a politician, Carnot. The French succeeded by unshakable conviction, which permitted the political leaders to proceed to all extremity in their determination to save the revolution, by the peculiar physical powers of endurance which their army displayed, and finally, of course, by certain accidents, for accident will always be a determining factor in war. The spring of 1793, the months of April and May, form the first crisis of the Revolutionary War. The attack about to be delivered is universal, and seems absolutely certain to succeed. With the exception of the rush at Jemaps, where less than 30,000 Austrians were broken through by a torrent superior in numbers, though even there obviously ill-organized, no success had attended the revolutionary armies. Their condition was, even to the eyes of the layman, bad, and to the eye of the expert, hopeless. There was no unity apparent in direction. There were vast lesions in the discipline of the ranks, like great holes torn in some rotten fabric. Even against the forces already mobilized against it, it had proved powerless, and it might be taken for granted that by an act more nearly resembling police work than a true campaign, the Allies would reach Paris, and something resembling the old order be soon restored. What remains is to follow the process by which this expectation was disappointed. The situation at this moment can best be understood by a glance at a sketch map on page 178. Two great French advances had been made in the winter of 1792-93. The one on northern advance, which we have just detailed, the overrunning of Belgium, the other an eastern advance right up to the Rhine and to the town of Mayence. Both had failed. The failure in Belgium, culminating in the treason of Dumouriez, has been read. On the Rhine, where Mayence had been annexed by the French Parliament just as Belgium had been, the active hostility of the population and the gathering of the organized forces of the Allies had the same effect as had been produced in the Low Countries. It was on March 21st, 1793, that the Prussians crossed the Rhine at Bacharach, and within that week the French commander, Custine, began to fall back. On the 1st of April he was back again in French territory, leaving the garrison of Mayence, somewhat over 20,000 men, to hold out as best it could. A fortnight later the Prussians had surrounded the town and the siege had begun. On the northeastern front, stretching from the Ardennes to the sea, a similar state of things was developing. 
There a barrier of fortresses stood between the Allies and Paris, and a series of sieges corresponding to the siege of Mayence in the east had to be undertaken. At much the same time as the investment of Mayence on April 9th, the first step in this military task was taken by the Allies, moving in between the fortress of Condé and the fortress of Valenciennes. Thenceforward it was the business of the Austrians under Coburg with the allies that were to reach him to reduce the frontier fortresses one by one and when his communications were thus secure to march upon paris it is here necessary for the reader unacquainted with military history to appreciate two points upon which not a little of contemporary historical writing may mislead him the first is that both in the rhine valley and on the belgian frontier the forces of the allies in their numbers and their organization were conceived to be overwhelming. The second is that no competent commander on the spot would have thought of leaving behind him the garrison or even one untaken fortress. It is important to insist upon these points because the political passions roused by the revolution are still so strong that men can hardly write of it without prejudice and bias, and two errors continually present in these descriptions of the military situation in the spring of 1793, are, first, that the Allies were weakened by the Polish question, which was then active, and secondly, that the delay of their commanders before the French fortress was unnecessary. Both these propositions are put forward with the object of explaining the ultimate defeat of the enemies of the Revolution. Both, however, great the authority behind them, are unhistorical and worthless. The French success was a military success due to certain military factors, both of design and accident, which will appear in what follows. The Allies played their part as all the art of war demanded it to be played. They were ultimately defeated, not from the commission of any such gross and obvious error in policy or strategy as historians with too little comprehension of military affairs sometimes pretend, but from the military superiority of their opponents it is true that the polish question that is the necessity the austrian and prussian governments were each under of watching that the other was not lessened in importance by the approaching annexations of further polish territory with the consequent jealousy and mistrust that arose from this between austria and prussia was a very important feature of the moment but it is bad military history to pretend that this affected the military situation on the Rhine or in the Netherlands. Every campaign is conditioned by its political object. The political object in this case was to march upon and to occupy Paris. The political object of the campaign was determined, the size and the organization of the enemy are calculated, and a certain force is brought against it. No much larger force is brought than is necessary. To act in such a fashion would be in military art what paying two or three times the price of an article would be in commerce. The forces of the Allies upon the Rhine and in the Netherlands were, in the opinion of every authority of the time, amply sufficient for their purpose, and more than sufficient. So much more than sufficient that the attitude of that military opinion which had to meet the attack, to wit, the professional military opinion of the French Republican soldiers, was that the situation was desperate. Nor, indeed, was it attempted to be met, save by violent and, as it were, irrational enthusiasm. The second point, the so-called delay involved in the sieges undertaken by the Allies, proves, when it is put forward, an insufficient acquaintance with the contemporary conditions. Any fortress with a considerable garrison left behind, untaken, would have meant the destruction of the Austrian or Prussian communications, and their destruction at a moment when the Austrian and Prussian forces were actually advancing over a desperately hostile country. Moreover, when acting against forces wholly inferior in discipline and organization, an untaken fortress is a refuge which one must take particular pains to destroy. To throw himself into such a refuge will always stand before the commander of those inferior forces as a last resource. It is a refuge which he will certainly avail himself of, ultimately, if it is permitted to him, 
and when he has so availed himself of it, it means the indefinite survival of an armed organization in the rear of the advancing invaders. We must conclude, if we are to understand this critical campaign, which changed the history of the world, that Coburg did perfectly right in laying siege to one fortress after another before he began what everyone expected to be the necessarily successful advance on Paris. The French despair, as one town after another surrendered, is an amply sufficient proof of the excellence of his judgment. The End of Section 24